Good evening. I continue with page 70 with proactivity defined. We're still in habit one. Be proactive. In discovering the basic principle of the nature of man, Frankel described an accurate self-map from which he began to develop the first and most basic habit of a highly effective person in any environment, the habit of proactivity. While the word proactivity is now fairly common in management literature, it is a word you won't find in most dictionaries. It means more than merely taking initiative. It means that as human beings, we are responsible for our own lives. Our behavior is a function of our decisions, not our conditions. We can subordinate feelings to values. We have the initiative and the responsibility to make things happen. All right, I'm gonna try to hold this picture up for us so you can see. You have the freedom to choose and then there's, all right now. Look at the word responsibility. It is response and ability. The ability to choose your response. Highly proactive people recognize that responsibility. They do not blame circumstances, conditions, or conditioning for their behavior. Their behavior is a product of their own conscious choice based on values rather than a product of their conditions based on feeling. Because we are by nature proactive, if our lives are a function of conditioning and conditions, it is because we have, by conscious decision or by default, chosen to empower those things to control us. In making such a choice, we become reactive. Reactive people are often affected by their physical environment. If the weather is good, they feel good. If it isn't, it affects their attitude and their performance. Proactive people can carry their own weather with them. Whether it rains or shines makes no difference to them. They are value driven. And if their value is to produce good quality work, it isn't a function of whether the weather is conducive to it or not. Reactive people are also affected by their social environment, by the social weather. When people treat them well, they feel well. When people don't, they become defensive or protective. Reactive people build their emotional lives around the behavior of others, empowering the weaknesses of other people to control them. The ability to subordinate an impulse to a value is the essence of the proactive person. Reactive people are driven by feelings, by circumstances, by conditions, by their environment. Proactive people are driven by values, carefully thought about, selected, and internalized values. Proactive people are still influenced by external stimuli, whether physical, social, or psychological. But their response to the stimuli, conscious or unconscious, is a value-based choice or response. As Eleanor Roosevelt observed, no one can hurt you without your consent. In the words of Gandhi, they cannot take away our self-respect if we do not give it to them. It is our willing permission, our consent to what happens to us, 
that hurts us far more than what happens to us in the first place. I admit this is very hard to accept emotionally, especially if we have had years and years of explaining our misery in the name of circumstance or someone else's behavior. But until a person can say deeply and honestly, I am what I am today because of the choices I made yesterday, that person cannot say, I choose otherwise. Once in Sacramento, when I was speaking on the subject of proactivity, a woman in the audience stood up in the middle of my presentation and started talking excitedly. It was a large audience, and as a number of people turned to look at her, she suddenly became aware of, became aware of what she was doing grew embarrassed and sat back down. But she seemed to find it difficult to restrain herself and started talking to the people around her. She seemed so happy. I could hardly wait for a break to find out what had happened. When it finally came, I immediately went to her and asked if she would be willing to share her experience. You just can't imagine what's happened to me, she exclaimed. I'm a full-time nurse to the most miserable, ungrateful man you could possibly imagine. Nothing I do is good enough for him. He never expresses appreciation. He hardly even acknowledges me. He constantly harps at me and finds fault with everything I do. This man has made my life miserable, and I often take my frustrations out on my family. The other nurses feel the same way. We almost pray for his demise. <clears throat> and for you to have the gall to stand up there and suggest that nothing can hurt me, that no one can hurt me without my consent, and that I have chosen my own emotional life of being miserable? Well, there was just no way I could buy into that. But I kept thinking about it. I really went inside myself and began to ask, do I have the power to choose my response? When I finally realized that I do have the power, when I swallowed that bitter pill and realized that I had chosen to be miserable, I also realized that I could choose not to be miserable. At that moment, I stood up. I felt as though I was being let out of San Quentin. I wanted to yell to the whole world, I am free. I am let out of prison. No longer am I going to be controlled by the treatment of some person. It is not what happens to us, but our response to what happens to us that hurts us. Of course, things can hurt us physically or economically and can cause sorrow, but our character... Our basic identity does not have to hurt at all. In fact, our most difficult experiences become the crucibles that forge our character and develop the internal powers. The freedom to handle difficult circumstances in the future and to inspire others to do so as well. I hope that's clear, because it looks clear. Frankel is one of many who have been able to develop the personal freedom in difficult circumstances to lift and inspire others. The autobiographical accounts of Vietnam prisoners of war provide additional persuasive testimony of the transforming power of such personal freedom and the effect of the responsible use of that freedom on the prison culture and on the prisoners, both then and now. We have all known individuals in very difficult circumstances, perhaps with a terminal illness or a severe physical handicap, 
to maintain magnificent emotional strength, how inspired we are by their integrity. Nothing has a greater, longer lasting impression upon another person than the awareness that someone has transcended suffering, has transcended circumstance, and is embodying and expressing a value that inspires and ennobles and lifts life. One of the most inspiring times Sandra and I have ever had took place over a four year period with a dear friend of ours named Carol who had a wasting cancer disease. She had been one of Sandra's bridesmaids and they had been best friends for over 25 years. When Carol was in the last, the very last stages of the disease, Sandra spent her time at her bedside helping her write her personal history. She returned from those protracted and difficult sessions, almost transfixed by admiration for her friend's courage and her desire to write special messages to be given to her children at different stages in their lives. Carol would take a little pain -killing medi as little pain-killing medication as possible so that she had full access to her mental and emotional facilities. Faculties. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Then she would whisper into a tape recorder or to Sandra directly as she took notes. Carol was so proactive, so brave, and so concerned about others that she became an enormous source of inspiration to many people around her. I'll never forget the experience of looking deeply into Carol's eyes the day before she passed away and sensing out of that deep, hollowed agony a person of tremendous intrinsic worth I could see in her eyes a life of character, contribution, and service, as well as love and concern and appreciation. Many times over the years, I've asked groups of people how many have ever experienced being in the presence of a dying individual who had a magnificent attitude and communicated love and compassion and served in unmatchable ways to the very end. Usually about one fourth of the audience respond in the affirmative. I then usually ask how many of them will never forget these individuals, how many were transformed, at least temporarily, by the inspiration of such courage and were deeply moved and motivated to more noble acts of service and compassion. The same people respond again, almost inevitably. Victor Frankl suggests that there are three central values in life, the experiential or that which happens to us, the creative or that which we bring into existence, and the attitudinal, or our response in difficult circumstances, such as a terminal illness. My own experience with people confirms the point Frankel makes, that the highest of the three values is attitudinal. In that paradigm or reframing sense, in other words, what matters most is how we respond to what we experience in life. Difficult circumstances often create paradigm shifts, whole new frames of reference by which people see the world and themselves and others in it and what life is asking of them. Their larger perspective reflects, reflects the attitudinal values that lift and inspire us all. Taking the initiative.
Our basic nature is to act. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our basic nature is to act and not be acted upon, as well as enabling us to choose our response to particular circumstances. This empowers us to create circumstances. Taking initiative does not mean being pushy, obnoxious, or aggressive. It does mean recognizing our responsibility to make things happen. Over the years, I have frequently counseled people who wanted better jobs to show more initiative, to take interest and aptitude tests, to study the industry, even the specific problems the organizations they are interested in are facing, and then to develop an effective presentation showing how their abilities can help solve the organization's problem. It's called solution selling, and it is a key paradigm in business success. The response is usually agreement. Most people can see how powerfully such an approach would affect their opportunities for employment or advancement. But many of them fail to take the necessary steps, the initiative to make it happen. Oh, the sky is beautiful. Huh. I don't know where to go to take the interest and aptitude tests. How do I study industry and organizational problems? No one wants to help me. I don't have any idea how to make an effective presentation. Many people wait for something to happen or someone to take care of them. But people who end up with the good jobs are the proactive ones who are solutions to problems, not problems themselves, who seize the initiative to do whatever is necessary, consistent with correct principles to get the job done. Whenever someone in our family, even one of the younger children, takes an irresponsible position and waits for someone else to make things happen or provide a solution, we tell them, use your R and I, resourcefulness and initiative. In fact, often before we can say it, they answer their own complaints. I know. Use my R and I. Holding people to the responsible course is not demeaning. It is affirming. <clears throat> Proactivity is part of human nature. And although the proactive muscles may be dormant, they are there by respecting the proactive nature of other people. We provide them with at least one clear, undistorted reflection from the social mirror. Of course, the maturity level of the individual has to be taken into account. We cannot expect high creative cooperation from those who are deep into emotional dependence. But we can at least affirm their basic nature and create an atmosphere where people can seize opportunities and solve problems in an increasingly self-reliant way. Let's see, I'm gonna stop there. See if I can read another 10 minutes to that beautiful sky. I appreciate you letting me read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Kelly. And listening and watching. I appreciate you.